a warm welcome to the American Theatre Wing seminars on working in the theatre. These are coming to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. I'd like to mention this is the 23rd year that we have been doing these seminars, and they've covered every part of the theatre, from the performers, the producers, the playwright, the directors, the set and scene and costume designers, choreographers, and the unions and guilds, all the people that make up the show that is brought to you, the audience, to enjoy and to be a part of in this wonderful New York City. The American Theatre Wing, perhaps, is best known for its Tony Award. And right now, this is the 50th anniversary of the Antoinette Perry Tony Award. And Antoinette Perry was the woman in whose honor we name these, affectionately known as the Tonys. She was a producer, a director, a playwright, all the people, all the things. She wore all the hats that I've just described. But above all, she believed in training and being prepared for the theater, taking what you know, <coughs> sharing it, and bringing it out to the community. And that's what the wing has been doing and does it as a year-round organization. We go to hospitals and nursing homes and aid centers. We have a program that brings theater personalities into high schools for them to talk with the students on what it is to work in the theater. We bring students from the high school into Broadway shows, and these are students that have never been to a show, never been to Broadway, and yet when the opportunity is there for them to buy a ticket at a ridiculously small amount, which the wing has made possible with the cooperation of the producers, the hands go up and they come running on their own to Broadway to see their first show. We also have a grants and scholarship program, and that is based with, on the same qualifications as the Tony Award is, and that is the achievement of excellence in the craft of theater. And we reward each year with our scholarship program a money reward that goes to those Broadway, off-off Broadway, and talent training schools that have consistently shown their adherence to training and producing in the theater. These seminars are perhaps one of the most knowledgeable and most important things that the wing can possibly bring to the community, the community of the theater, as well as the community at large, those people that want to learn about the theater and go to the theater. I will hesitate to take up any more of your time, and I want to turn it over today on this seminar, which is based on revivals. And I would like to introduce Dasha Epstein, who is a producer. Uh, she's a member of the board of directors of the American Theatre Wing, and Dasha has produced such Tony Award-winning shows as Eight Misbehaving, Children of a Lesser God, among others. And Dasha is going to take over the program, and I hope that she will bring out the importance of what we are seeing on Broadway today with the important people that we have here today. And Dasha will introduce them to you. Dasha Epstein. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Isabel, and hello to all of you, and welcome, and thank you for being here. And you are the people that make theater happen. And in this season alone on Broadway, which officially ends on May 1st this year, there were 38 openings, of which 18 were revivals, 14 plays, and four musicals. Even in regional theaters or off-Broadway, revivals are more popular to produce. Mr. Robert Whitehead, a veteran of 50 years on Broadway and the producer of this year's very successful and original play, Masterclass, was quoted in the New York Times saying, the Broadway tradition of taking an original play or musical and shepherding it from written page to the stage has all but ceased. I agree, for I believe that the rising cost of producing has made it necessary for producers to limit their risk factor. Regional theater successes such as Annie, London hits as Les Mis and popular revivals such as Guys and Dolls 
and the king and I are a much safer haven. Familiarity with the material and nostalgia make it easier to attract an audience and therefore the producer knows he has a better chance to raise investment money. It is a known fact that the majority of theater goers today have a gold card and that they are also over 50 years old. And they remember with marvelous, marvelous remembrances past productions and relate warmly and emotionally to seeing them again and recount their appreciation to their children, their grandchildren, family, and friends. Hopefully, they will attract a new generation to the theater. However, this is 1996, and television and home videos have made it easier, more comfortable, and much less expensive to have entertainment at home. Therefore, to attract an audience, one must combine this established friendship with the past and add originality, timeliness, and inventive ways of bringing the past into the present. To recreate a work which has been done before does not mean that original work is excluded. On the other hand, it takes a great deal of talent to present a fresh look at revivals. Here with us today are a group of experts who know how to make the old look new and to tell us why it is so important to revive the great theater of the past. So let us welcome back to Broadway those producers, performers, and writers who have given us great theater in the past and are still working very hard at it today. Thank you. And let me introduce and thank you all for being here again. And let me introduce, starting on my left, is Joseph Stein, who is the author of Fiddler on the Roof and of many other works, including Rags, Zorba, and The Baker's Wife, to name but a few. Sitting next to Joseph is Charlie Stein. Ch I'm sorry, Charlie Strauss. Charlie Strauss. Charlie Strauss is a composer of several smash musicals, including Bye Bye Birdie, Applause, Rags, and of course, Annie. Next to Charles is sitting Susan Stroman, choreographer of this season's big, which opens this Sunday, fingers crossed, and good luck, and who brought us back to Showboat. Sitting next to Susan, thank heavens you're back from Hollywood. You went from Broadway to Hollywood, and now we're lucky to have you back. Nathan Lane, and of course, you know him as the star of Love, Valor, and Compassion last year's Laughter on the 23rd Floor, Guys and Dolls, and today the big hit, a funny thing happened on the way to the form. Uh, starting now here on my left from the beginning is Ted Chapin. Ted Chapin is president and executive director of the Rogers and Hammerstein organization. He has amassed Broadway credits as a production or directorial assistant for Follies, The Rothschilds, and Candide. Next to Ted is Donna McKechnie, currently appearing in State Fair. Past Broadway shows included the original cast of How to Succeed, A Funny Thing Happened, Promises, Promises, Company, and of course, A Chorus Line. Next to Donna is Cy Fuhr, the producer of the original Guys and Dolls and many Broadway shows. He's president of the American Theater and producers. And sitting next to, uh, to, uh, uh, to Cy is Martin Gottfried, my co-moderator and friend, an esteemed theater critic, and author of Broadway musicals, biographies of Stephen Sondheim, George Burns, and Bob Fosse, and he is now leading a series of conversations at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, interviewing such theatrical luminaries as Andrew Lloyd Webber, Hal Prince, and others. Thank you, and here we go. Um, I'd just like to say something of uh, introductory nature before we begin. When I became a theater critic a thousand years ago in 1963, there were Broadway musicals opening all the time. The first show, uh, the last show that I bought a ticket for, actually the money went into Cy Fewer's pocket <coughs> for uh, The Little Me. Oh, thank and you I, very much. And then I, <laughs> then I saw um, A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, which had just opened with Zero Mostel, and then the first show I reviewed was really like just being a kid in a candy store was Oliver that was in January. In those times, 
There were musicals opening all the, so many new musicals opening all the time that a revival was a dirty word. And there was no need for the old. Broadway ignored the old because it had so much of the new and nobody was going to pay for it. Um, your old friend Gene Dalrymple, who was here so often, would run a series. Remember Charles at the city center? Re reviving all these shows that we see now and nobody would go because they weren't interested in Guys and Dolls or Brigadier or whatever for the fourth time when there was so much new. Today, it's just the reverse. To me, Broadway is a place for the new. It's where all our talent creates. And without the new, I don't know where the revivals of tomorrow are going to be. On the other hand, without the past, we have no tradition at all. So that's what we want to talk about. And I want to ask Charles, because he is involved with both new shows and shows that are being, they're now, aren't they talking about reviving applause now? Mm -hmm. right? yeah. So you are, as most of us here are on both sides of this issue, what do you think? Is this good or bad or what? Well, I, I'm not on both sides of the issue. Uh, uh, if, if you're saying, is it a good thing, uh, it puts money in my pocket, puts money in authors, producers' pockets, authors who are, I would say, over 50, uh, makes money for the theaters. Uh, but uh, it's a bad thing because I think uh, the, uh, uh, the, the theater generally becomes more barren as a country would become more barren for, for lack of uh, technological advances uh, in the same way that that would happen. But I don't want to go on on that subject. It is something I think about a great deal because you have everybody here who knows so much about it, but I'll contribute. Well, Sai, you were responsible for so many of these shows when they first came out. I mean, How to Succeed, which you were in, Donna. Mm -hmm. yes. Donna. And, and you show. did that new. You did Can Can, Boyfriend, one after, I mean, Fewer and Martin were a legendary team and always new shows. Frank Lesser, Cole Porter. Where are these people? Why is this going on? Well, I, I, uh, I, I think that we have to take into consideration that the world has changed. Uh, primarily, that's very important. I think that uh, uh, comedy is a commodity that seemed to have disappeared recently with the advent of the uh, English musicals. They were all all based upon, had enormous productions based upon furrowed brow subjects, you know. And uh, what's happened, uh, I, I have to relate, uh, I, I do particularly, I have to relate to comedy because that's what we did only. I'm not, this has nothing to do with straight plays. And I think that when I say that the world has changed, the, the, the world of comedy has changed. Somehow or other, the younger generation now is, uh, is their, 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 their comedy is antic rather than witty. And, uh, we are, and, and we are therefore not developing writers along the witty line that we pursued uh, in, in, in former times. And it all now seems has to do with a whole different brand and outlook on, on humor. As a result, we're not developing the writers, and uh, I include in that the lyricists, who write funny. And uh, where do you go to the well to get this for your new productions? Consequently, there's a void, and it's being filled by these wonderful comedies of the past. And the, uh, the audience are responding to them today the way they had formerly. You go to see Nathan these days, and in, in, uh, I say Nathan, I mean for him, but uh, I could say Nathan. And, uh, and it's absolutely hilarious. The audience is responding to it in exactly the same way they did when it played formally. But here we have all the ingredients sitting around us for, uh, for a new show. I write funny music, I know that. <laughs> he does, as a matter of fact. A composer, a choreographer, two stars, a producer. I mean, my dad's got a barn. <laughs> <laughs> so why can't they, why can't you all put on a new show and get a new show done? You want us to do it now? <laughs> as a matter of fact, yes. So listen, you, know, you are doing a new show. Yes, and uh, we're. Big is going to open on Sunday, and it's all new. John Wyman is the writer, and Malt Shire are the composer and lyricist. And, uh, but I have to say, by doing revivals, I have learned about constructing a musical. And uh, what I learned, the knowledge that I took away from mounting Showboat, was invaluable to now mounting a new musical. Uh, Big is what separates Big from other uh, revivals or other musicals, so that it's contemporary. And contemporary times mean something different to everyone. So there's no history to base your music on. There's no history to base your dance on. So it, what will be seen on Sunday will be very innovative. 
it'll be something that's never been seen before. And it's because we've advanced technically, uh, just in sets and, and lighting, that we can now produce something that will be seen and hopefully will be reviving in 20 years, will be ri reviving big. Because there's always going to be a 13-year-old somewhere in the world. Susan, when, when everyone says, as they were saying, that producers are nervous about a new show and that's why they're doing old shows, did you feel around, was big tougher to get on? Or? I think, sure, I think because it was a, a whole new work, all new music and, and writing, and it was not, it's based on a screenplay, not a novel. It, uh, it was uh, difficult to actually construct it in the musical terms, and it took us quite a while. It, we finally cracked it, and it's been thrilling the last couple weeks to actually see where it's gone. But I feel that everyone, uh, the team who has worked on it, has really come from uh, doing revivals, studying them, doing theater, and it's really the knowledge that we've learned from this and, and viewing theater that's, that's helped us along. Showboat, the showboat that's at the Gershwin Theater is not really a revival, as what you would say a revival is. It's not a reconstruction. This showboat is different from any showboat that's ever been done before. It's directed and choreographed cinematically. It's directed and choreographed for a 1990s audience. And it, it, it deals with issues that have never been dealt with in showboat before. There's more dance in it. We can show the contributions that blacks have made to music and dance, which has never been done in showboat mm -hmm. before. So the idea of doing a revival for me, and I'm sure for a lot of us to, to do it, would be only to do it, to now do it in our eyes and our ways and do it with the technology that we have now. Mm -hmm. And Nathan, you've done two revivals, Guys and Dolls and Form. Is there, do you feel as if is, less, is it less fun or the same fun as creating a part? <clears throat> well, I guess it's um, the way we're talking today. It's, it's a guilty pleasure. Uh, <laughs> I, I would love to do a new musical, and, uh, but the, when you have the material uh, like Guys and Dolls and, and Forum, um, you also have the luxury of not having to go out of town and not having to uh, go through the agony of a new musical, and it is, it's wonderful just to have this brilliantly constructed material and, and, uh, and to play it. Um, uh, you know, I don't quite know what the answer is. I think Sai touched on something that, that is very true about um, we're not, we're not um, uh, bringing up the, the kinds of writers who, who used to write the, the books and, and lyrics for, for those shows. Um, and, uh, you know, what I hope is that um, when young people see uh, what I think are, have been, you know, terrific revivals of, of these shows, that it will hopefully inspire them the way it inspired me to want to go into the theater. I mean, Forum, especially, is a show I saw in high school, and, and I, saw, I saw a revival <laughs> 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 with Phil Silvers. <laughs> And and I know it's the forum is the kind of show that um, if you're if you're not a part of the theater, it makes you want to be a part of it, and if you are, it makes you very proud and happy to be a part of it. And uh, and I hope we will be doing the same, and and that somewhere some youngster will you know sit sit down and say I want to I want to be a part of that or write a new musical. Um, I don't know exactly what the answer is, but uh, I, I know that if it's if the material is well done, and, and uh, uh, I, although I would prefer to tr to work on something new, it is uh, it's still very exciting to to be a part of such great material, and it's it is a part of our heritage, and and I think it should be passed on, and and uh, and that it shouldn't we shouldn't let it lie dormant because uh, it was done once and done extremely well. As long as it isn't the only thing. As long as it isn't mm -hmm. the uh, only thing. Excuse me. With with all respect, <coughs> I like what you said, but early in your. Uh, discourse, you said we're not bringing forth writers uh, anymore. I, I disagree with that. There are a lot of them around, and there's an economic picture, which you pointed out at, at the beginning, which makes it very hard to raise the $8 million to put on a show versus the 2 and a half to $4 million to, to put on a revival. And uh, uh, I think the writers are there. Uh, I've, I've met, I've worked with a lot of them. I'm one of them. Uh, and uh, uh, it's always been tough for me to uh, put on shows, but today the economic uh, uh, picture is much different. I just call it on that, and everyone can speak more about it, but it is different. Ted, do you think 
that if these shows are popular, uh, Guys and Dolls or Forum, that, that that musical language and that theatrical language, which we grew up on, is that still appealing to audiences? Or are, there, are these new shows like Bring on the Funk and Rent, are, the, are those necessary to appeal to audience? I mean, who are, yeah. who are these shows selling to? Complicated question. Um, yeah, I thought so. Uh, <laughs> I'll answer it, though. Um, <laughs> First of all, I think everybody is in agreement with you that there is absolutely nothing on Broadway more exciting and thrilling than a new musical that is extraordinarily fabulous. I mean, there, the whole town feels it when a new musical opens that's on, on Broadway that just you know, wakes everybody up and makes everybody excited to go to the theater. Um, I think that, that, I mean, I love hearing what Susan said because in, in a way I think that's absolutely right. I, I think that the doing a show that has been done before put in the hands of the first-rate Broadway talents, and that's a change that I've seen since the, since the time that I've been at the Rogers and the Hammerstein organization. Um, you can learn great things from that, and I love hearing Susan say, yes, we've all learned from doing these shows that are very well constructed how to take those models and use them, because in, 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 in some ways, you know, I find with the Rogers and Hammerstein musicals, they are built extraordinarily well, and I mean, I've come to have a great respect for them. I've seen them done badly, I've seen them done well, I've seen them done extraordinarily. But, they, you know, they even withstand some bad productions and they stand up. Now, that having been said, that's not going to ensure new generations coming to see a bad production of a Rodgers and Hammerstein musical and say, wow, that's what I want to do. That's part of why I love the shows that are being done now of ours, because they're, they're dazzlingly exciting and they're in really good hands and people can be, you know, sort of blown away by them because they're really well done. And I think that's that's exciting. I want to ask one question. I don't want to take your, your your job here, but I, who am basically in this business, I hate the word revival. This year, for example, you have Hello Dolly. That's a revival. Now that's the original production, and Bill does the original production with a different director, but basically the original sets, the original you star. Replica. Yeah, and then you have Company, and you have Forum, and you have The King and I. Um, they're all different. Forum happens to be designed by the same designer who did it originally. And it's sort of the same floor plan, and it's sort of the same scheme, but it's a different design. King and I is not. Company isn't, and you know, I wonder if this word isn't the right is the wrong word to use. And I think when you said that there was a stigma against the word revival, you know, Hello Dolly is a revival. I don't think the others are revivals. I don't know what they are. Whether it's a reconstruction, whether it's a revisiting, whether what it is. But well, I think the stigma Ted, is is just that it's not a new show. You know, maybe a new approach to an old show. Now, do you feel, Donna, you're in State Fair, which is never was a show before. Mm -hmm. But do you feel? Is it a? Does it feel like a? Does it sit on you like it's a? Very new much a new show, yeah. <clears throat> from my point of view, and and of course I find the value in both things. I think I agree with you. There are writers out there. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, there's a lot of talent out there, and the economics um, prohibit a lot of things that we would like to do because the the most exciting thing is to have an original to create as an actress uh, an original part in an original musical and uh, in a book musical um, uh, the 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 thing that happened but the but the the also the element of of seeing form the other night and being so grateful to see it and showboat and really experiencing the new values because you are and I'm trying to connect all these things I've heard which are all very valid in the hands of the right people. I mean, one, as a training ground for a young dancer to be able to go to, into uh, how to succeed and work with Frank Lesser as a vocal coach and, and Cy Fuhr and uh, um, oh, Abe Burroughs as a director and Bob Fosse and to be, it's going to university, you know, and it, 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 was, a, and it was a great training ground. It's very important. And to, to be in a, in a show now where we have to create and we have to collaborate and we have to learn to give and take and it's very painful um, but then you you have all of the experience behind you and then you have the obligation to pass it on too you know I mean for for a, there were a couple years before State Fair came along and kind of answered my prayer again um, I, I was putting a show together a one-woman show and this is not what I came to New York to do I came to do the book musical and, uh, and from Rodgers and Hammerstein movies, you know, the, the, the shows. And all of a sudden, I, I had to keep dancing, and I had to keep singing, and I had to keep acting. 
and also became a very important thing for me for younger <clears throat> audiences because I teach also and I see the talent to experience the work of Bob Fosse and the original choreography of Michael Bennett and um, m music that I uh, from on the town and uh, and and to keep the ideas alive if not the whole you know all the shows but I didn't come to New York to do that but what I found out that there are writers out there because I made it a point to to um, to search and discover and we, we can't always I'm going on and on because I'm trying to connect with all these different things but I think I'm answering part of your question um, I see the value and, and a real value in, in both and and having um, what do you call if not a revival a re a recreation a recreation right right a recreation uh, mm -hmm. it's it's vital to have that I think it's very important to have that I like and, to ask two questions Nathan you said the it's the security of not having to go out of town and do, do all those <coughs> things of a new show what is the difference surely you have to even though it is a revival and you've got all of the road marks there, everything all is blocked for you, but still, what the audience will accept in the cutting of the show and the, and, and, uh, the working of people in between and the, the scenery working and everything else is still the same in the revival as it is in the new show. Right. What happens with a song like Pretty Little Pink? What, <laughs> what's the oh, difference? yes. <laughs> if I have one regret in life is that we cut Pretty Little Picture <laughs> from the revival. Um, uh, well, what you're, uh, I think what one of the things you're up against is that there are memories of an original production mm -hmm. and when people saw it for the very first time and, and you, you sort of sometimes, sometimes have to fight against that because well, even if they saw the show or not, something they heard about, you know, it, had become, it, it, it takes on a legendary quality. And so you, uh, with people like Jerry Zaks and Rob Marshall, they look at this, try to look at this piece of material as if it was just handed to them and say, how do we do this with, with a fresh eye? And as an example, uh, Comedy Tonight, which was, is sort of a famous story in the theater of a, a show, you know, the, the wonderful story Larry Galbart said, I wish Hitler were alive and were out of town with a musical. Um, when they were in Washington, they were, they had, they were having problems. The sh they, people weren't reacting the way they wanted them to. And the opening number was a song called Love is in the Air. Which, which is done in, in your movie. Which is done in my movie. Thanks for plugging my movie. Because <laughs> it really needs a lot of help now. Um, we like that. That's why Fox um, But yes, Love is in the Air is in uh, uh, the movie. But um, was the opening number, which is a very gentle sort of soft shoe. And, and it didn't quite uh, set up the show as for, for the rollicking farce that it was. And then Jerome Robbins came in. Was, was asked to come in and, and help and he, you know he su suggested that they needed the audience needed to know in a very simple number what the show was going to be about and Steve wrote comedy tonight and it, it changed everything um, from what they've said so um, when they were looking at it um, they wanted to th see how they what they could do with it that would be a little different and 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 not to go back to use the Jerome Robbins choreography and and uh, Jerry and Rob came up with this idea that the, the company has prepared to do a tragedy, actually, and, and you know, we haven't really, <laughs> that I've come out to pre present a comedy, and then suddenly it's a very expensive sight gag, but the curtain goes up, <laughs> and there's Great. the entire set of Medea, and, uh, which they're performing, and, and then the curtain comes back down, and, and uh, slowly they, they realize they've prepared for the wrong show, and then by the end we've all gotten together. Um, which I thought was a great wa approach to this, you know, wonderful song, and and, uh, um, and so yeah, and I, I myself have, you know, I, I, I've heard about Zero Mustel many times now, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, so you're you're you also have to, you know, I don't know whether you're living up to it, but there's a memory of him in that role, and because he did the movie, and, uh, and uh, um, you just have to, all you can do is, is approach it as if it were a brand new brand show. New. And, and, but you don't have to go through the, what they went through, which is trying to figure out, you know, the, the construction, and the, construction. Uh, of a show and, and uh, what's working and what's not, because it's all been done for you in a, in a sense. Going out of Although it's valuable. Oh, absolutely. Valuable. I mean, because that, it's the audience is the last part of the process that yeah. you add to creating a show. Mm -hmm. They're going to tell you if it's right or not. And it's interesting, actually, you know, in these in these uh, politically correct times, 
uh, it was interesting um, doing, say, for example, a number like the House of Marcus Lycus, which is, uh, you know, I'm there to, to buy flesh. <laughs> and, um, and it's interesting, an audience, how an audience reacts to it. I, and, and it's very, I'm sure it's, I have a feeling it's very different from how they react in 1962. So. They're much and, more smart. Uh, you know, there, there were a couple of lines that we actually took out because you just sense the audience mm -hmm. get very uncomfortable about it. And, uh, um, you know, so. So I think, you know, you... Uh, That's you what theater should do, is make an audience uncomfortable. Make an audience uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you... I, I, I'm trying to drive them out of the theater. <laughs> if I could take up from something yeah. that, that Nathan said, in, in, towards the sort of creativity of Robotics, lest anybody feel that you just sort of pull it off the shelf and it only costs two and a half as opposed to six million and put it up there and bingo, it'll be, it'll be good. Um, there are two shows, two revivals, Forum and King and I, both of which Jerome Robbins worked on originally. And um, in Forum, his work is not included. They, they decided to take another angle at it. And in The King and I, The Small House of Uncle Thomas is such a classic piece that nobody felt you could better it. Um, it is what it is, and it's integral to The King and I. So that piece of Jerome Robbins is absolutely intact. This production has added a couple of things that they chose not to do originally, like having the king visible while he's watching it, which sets up the whole point of why what the, the, the tension is between Tuptim and the king. You know, and the convention in the 50s was that the king was out in the back of the auditorium, and there's an awkward moment when Tuptim confronts him, and the dancers are supposed to sort of feel uncomfortable and twitch a little bit. And I never understood when I saw the show as a kid what that, what's going on there. Now you see it. But also other choreography in The King and I is new. So that in, in a way, that was a creative choice made of keeping some original stuff absolutely intact and yet taking other things and approaching it from a completely new, new standpoint. Anyway, that's that goes part of revivals. Yeah, okay. I'd, li oh, Henry, I'd like to ask a question of you, Ted. Um, what to what extent does the estate, say, of Rodgers and Hammerstein, protect protect a work in its originality? Oh, vehemently. And that's uh, <laughs> no. We like to have the reputation of being of telling everybody that you can't change a single thing. Mm -hmm. Then we like to hear what you want to change. <laughs> Um, no, because I think, I mean, luckily the people who I work for, the, the, the sons and daughters of people named Rogers and Hammerstein, are themselves theater people. Mary Rogers wrote Once Upon a Mattress and Freaky Friday. James Hammerstein was the stage manager of Flower Drum Song and has directed, among other things, State mm -hmm. Fair. So that when we sit down and talk about these things, we're all talking the same language. And there are risks, and you don't make all the right decisions. I'd like to speak in the, for the revival. Thank uh, you. You just made a point that you protected. What you're actually reviving are the words that were written. That is what the revival is. All the other stuff can be done in any num number of ways. You can get one choreographer or another, you can get one set designer or another, but the words are fundamental. The words, music, and lyrics. And therefore, they're revivals, no matter which way you twist them. And I don't find it objectionable. Uh, I, I always feel that when you want to call them classic or something, we're sort of self-consciously avoiding the word revival. And I'd rather have it than uh, be self-conscious about trying to avoid it. Uh, and also, time, uh, I'll give up my argument. <laughs> uh, for instance, in Guys and Dolls, it was terrific. They did everything, including all the outmoded references. You know, they spoke of sacks and clines and colonizing furs and things like that. Didn't change a thing. And it was quite wonderful, and the audience responded great, wonderfully. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, we had done a revival of it about 15 years ago with Milton Berle playing Nathan out in California when Ernie and I were at the Civic Light Opera out there. And uh, I directed it, and I had the opportunity of now uh, having winches, which we never had in those days. You know, the guys, the original Guys and Dolls was built in one and depth, and one and depth, one and depth. In other words, when you go into one, it's about a 10-foot uh, area from the apron back to the curtain. So that you could drop the curtain and the stagehands could come on and change the sets behind the curtain in one while that was going on. And then you raise the curtain and you go into depth. The next scene had to be in one so you could change the set again. It had to be done by hand. You didn't want to see stagehands running around the rooms. And uh, I now had the opportunity of doing it with winches. And I had Bob Randolph, who was a wonderful designer, and we opened up the whole show. And it spoiled it. I can't tell you why. It was written to be done in one in depth, you know. And when you guys were going to do it, I had a meeting with Tony Walton, 
And I said to him, Tony, uh, we had this experience, and he thought about it, and you did your show in the old-fashioned way, if you remember. It was kind of dressed up not to look that way, but when the guys came out with the carnations, they were all lined up in one, you know? Right. Always found that odd. And, and consequently, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but uh, uh, hooray for the arrival. Let me just... Uh, yeah, but also, on, on, King and I, what, on the uh, King and I, they did open up, because yeah, now... But, but also, on, on yeah. the other hand, uh, uh, that story... Um, there's a lot of there are a lot of crossovers. I mean, the sound of music is filled with scenes that have two kids running across with a candle, Certainly. blowing it out, and you wonder w w what's that for. We also restored the score. I know that sounds like a strange thing to do, but actually there were lots of wrong notes, so we recopied all the parts for the sound of music, and we got an orchestra together one day just before we published it to listen to it. And all I can tell you is they must have been the loudest sets on Broadway because the sh scene change music, quiet scene in the second act, suddenly lonely goat herd, full brass section, <laughs> yeah, right. you know, for 32 bars and then out. And we right, looked at right, each other and said, right. there, that piece of scenery must have been a very, very noisy <laughs> set change. On the other hand, when I heard that you were doing King and I, uh, my first reaction was, what a story. What a story, you know. It's Wins a marvelous over. story. And there you have it, you know. Wins them over. Can I bring up something about just the, well, go ahead. No, go, go. Uh, Just to c continue this, too, about we had the luxury of, uh, of touring. Um, you know, we talk about the expenses of one versus the other. And when people say, where are the writers? Where are the writers? Well, they're there, but it's like how much economically it's so hard to do anything. But we had the luxury, and maybe a, a very unique situation, of doing a new show, but taking it on the road for seven months. This show still isn't frozen, right. by the way. And we had also the protection of, of R&H, but um, the, the, the risk-taking of the director, <coughs> who was part of the family. So we kept, like the onion skin, we kept changing and fixing and slowly, and we couldn't rehearse all the time, but we slowly did it. And it was... It's great. I think that's a real major problem, though. Well, why could you take a revival of State Fair on the road for seven months and not a new show for seven months? Well, if it, was, it became State a new show. State Fair is, is a that bit is of, unique. Yeah. yeah, it's a bit of an yeah. odd thing because a lot of people bought it on the road thinking it was a revival. Because it was Roger right. Neverstein State Fair, but they knew that. But on the whole, what's the difference on it? On, on those, those traditions, what's the difference between the security of a revival, being able to go on the road and to be able to do the things you're doing, as against the new show. Selling tickets. Same it's risk, same set, same lighting, mm -hmm. same the whole thing. No, but What's it's, the difference? It's, uh, to take a show out, when Crazy Few went to Washington, it was an extra million dollars to go to Washington mm -hmm. with Crazy Few. But it was invaluable because we rewrote the second act of Crazy right. Few in Washington. So when we came in, we came in with a wonderful show that ran for five years. Had we had not gone out to Washington, that would not I have I think happened. it's very important, yes. but I can't see... I think it's important for every show. You're kind of half a revival. Half a revival. Yeah, but was that was a new book. It, it was kind Ken of a new Ludwig show, you know. In, uh, way, but it? it was the idea of playing that new book in front of an audience to right. let you know if it was right. going to work. Enough. Yes, yeah. and they, they have Ken Ludwig writing this. Where, where, you, right. where you have a new writer sure. developing... Joe, new. where would you get started? There's no shows... For anyone to learn how to, to write librettos. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you're worried about me. <laughs> <laughs> now, actually, I don't see that there's any big problem between a revival and a new show. I mean, the, the, aside from the, the major problem of the e economics, but uh, I mean, all the, all the writers I know who have written shows that are being revived are also working on their shows. Uh, you know the, the important thing is getting you know getting stuff done. Uh, the problem that the economic problem is enormous. There are very few theaters available and very few producers. As a matter of fact, now you know in order to do a show, the producers outnumber the cast. <laughs> you know you have ten or twelve. You know when 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 the, when Frank Lesser was was being produced, we had they had one producer. Uh, Fiddler on the Roof was produced by one producer. Now it's a matter of getting eight or ten people together, or fifteen, I don't even know who they are, and in order to get a show done. But aside from that, the, the actual work is the same. Uh, I, I'm working on a new show, uh, and the, the writers I know who are seasoned in the theater and have written shows that are being revived are all working on new material. And I... Uh, the the uh, the problem of of uh, 
of a new show, it's against a revival, is, as Susan says, fashioning it. A revival, you know, when we do Zorba or Fiddler or one of those shows, it's done. When, we, when we're doing a new show, we, must, we need the out-of-town experience to, to get the kinks out, to see where the problems are and to solve them. But otherwise, I think a revival of a good show is, is great, the re and, a, and a new show uh, has every reason to exist. Do you think, Susan, that the economics, and speaking as a producer, limit your vision of a show, knowing that you could go much further if you had the uh, There is that extra of pressure. That that extra pressure when you know that if you make a mistake you could be making a twenty thousand dollar mistake so when you are creating there is that that extra pressure of finances <coughs> that i don't think were there years ago even uh, a, a simple pickaxe in crazy few is five hundred dollars so if i ordered twelve pickaxes i better use them <laughs> so it's it really it does put an extra <coughs> pressure on you but i think uh, we need to take the responsibility to support the new writers and especially people uh, here that that can take a chance and and try to talk others into taking chances on new writers i think it's our responsibility otherwise we won't have any future you know the, the it's the younger generation too that we have to pull into the theater because they are the future of broadway and we have to pull them away from the tv set and the video machines and bring them to the theater so we need to gear ourselves right now to a younger generation to try to, to try to entice them and have them embrace theater. It's important, but it needs to come from us. It needs to come from the people who can, and also the people who are willing to take a chance. Well, also speaking as a producer, I think that uh, the idea of a show such as Rent opening and an advance today of a show which is opening is so important because it keeps your show running for a few weeks until you get the advertising and word of mouth started. And I'm also curious to see what the advance as a sh for a show, such as The King and I, which has a, quite a large advance, that people are familiar again with it, so they will buy tickets quicker. Also, it's easier for us to get investors in the theater to participate in it if they know what they are, what they are buying into, rather than, and yet, I believe so strongly, as we all do, about finding new shows. So it is a very big balance economically. I can't, I can't help but wonder what the, what the mentality of our musical theater is in our time. For a while, it really seemed to me, whenever I was a guest professor or just giving a lecture, or just at the theater for that matter, no matter how much the Broadway establishment was resisting all the British shows, it was plain to me that young people were responding to Les Mis, to to the Andrew Lloyd Webber show. They loved them. My daughter loved them. The kids loved them. That was their guys and dolls. And these shows or that we're talking about, these revivals, are speaking a language of 30, 40 years ago. I don't know what would be, will be the language of our, our theater today that will bring in tomorrow's audience. I don't know what their idea of musical theater is. I mean, are these shows... Do you think that these shows are playing to audiences across the whole board? Are your, your audiences young, Nathan, or, or? A lot of them, yeah. A lot of, and I mean, some of them obviously are. It, it ha may have to do with the 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 movie the, the, that I'm in that people are uh, you know curious to who don't know my work in the theater, and and then <clears throat> some of them are people who who have followed my career in the theater and and. Uh, it's just great to see young people in the theater, um, for me. Um, and, and part of it, as, as well as developing new writers, is, is also... Uh, we, what we also haven't been developing are, are theater stars. There used to be a, there was a time when people wanted to go see a, a certain person in a show, and, and because of shows like, like Cats and, 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 and some of the others, it, no one, it's just sort of an anonymous thing, and, uh, and we, we're not... You know, I mean, I'm sure there are, the performers are out there, but uh, we're not sort of creating those kinds of stars that make people also bring people into the theater as well as the, the material itself. Economics again. Yeah. Well, yeah. Sorry, what about the, the creative producer? What happened to him? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I really, well, I'll tell you, it, it was much easier. The economics play, play a large part in it. With Ernie and I, every show we've ever done, with the exception of The Boyfriend, which we found in London, 
we came up with the idea, it was our idea, and then we would cast the writers. And, uh, and it was a battle, you know, we, uh, we, would, uh, we would go forth together and do it, and we could do it for $125,000 or $150,000. Or later on, I think the most expensive show we've ever done was under a million of all of our shows. And you had writers like Cole Porter? Yeah, well, well, we, we had all these writers. But, but it wasn't only Cole Porter. We could just come up with an idea without stars. Incidentally, we never had stars, real stars, at the exception of Ray Bolger in our first show. And it was, it was economically feasible to try it. We had a bunch of backers. I said we had about 75 backers. They would put up anywhere from $1,000 to $10,000 a piece, and we had a musical. And consequently, we could come up with an idea, get a couple of guys together, and do a show, you know, without, without your barn. You know, it was the equivalent of your barn. Do you know uh, how much it costs to do a workshop, though? Forget about doing producing or... Probably mounting. cost what our first show cost. A million, yeah. 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 yeah one, so that, one that's very really hard. From last year, which I found astonishing, Call Me Madam was done for four performances at City Center as part of the Encore series. And it cost $5,000 more than the original production in 1950 that went out of town with full sets, costumes, and what Can I just say one thing about this? I just wanted to not lose, because this is, I'm so interested in what everyone is saying, but there's something that I wanted to bring back to about the new generations coming to the theater, be it revival or an original show. You know, we can do it both ways, but but to, to answer your thing about uh, the language of these shows from the 40s and the and 2000 BC, mm -hmm. you know, uh, <laughs> is this language and for the new generation? Yes, there's room for everything, I think. And I know from coming out the stage door, doing a show that is a, a piece of uh, 1946, is that Incise put his finger on it. He said, "What a story." You know, for King and I, if the story is there, if it's in a human scale in some way, you know, the people will come and the little kids will come and see it and the parents and the grandparents because it's a, the story works. And if the story works, then they don't sure. care if it's 1946. It's, in, it's more interesting because it enhances their, their sense of, of their tradition and their world. But the kids lo love the show and it's their first musical. And I get such a pleasure out of seeing them and I go, you can't, this has to be your first musical because it's a five-year-old child. Oh, no. And, <laughs> you know, it's wonderful because they really appreciate it. So whether they see State Fair or, or Form or Rent, you know, I'm, I can't wait to see that myself. What about Big? That's the big, big that's yes. the big adventure today, it really that's is. Right. It's, the, you know, the stories of 10 million and up and uh, you don't have a star, really. I mean, not a not what we would call a star, yeah, you know. But we have a great actor. I understand that, but that's what... The, <laughs> and that's what uh, I know you do. That, 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 as a matter of fact, that's my point, that you're betting on the ability of, the, of, of these people rather than on, on the star pull. Sure. In our day, we used, to have, we used to pay a star 10% of the gross because they would do that kind of business. Cole Porter. We had a show in... in uh, uh, we did with Cole Porter called Silk Stockings. We had, we had Don Amici in it and uh, Hildegard Neff and Don Amici was all past his prime, you know. But you put Cole Porter up there, and he was a 10 percenter. In other words, he would sell out on the basis of Cole Porter. We had the show in Philadelphia. We had torn down the first act, and we hadn't fixed the second act. We had two different acts. One had nothing to do with the other. And we sold out for the whole five minutes <laughs> because Cole Porter's name was up there. And uh, it, as a matter of fact, in hindsight, maybe we should have left it that way. <laughs> It's interesting. One of the things that I think is coming out of this conversation, which, which I think is important, is, is it all starts with the writing. And with all due respect to the British musicals, and I think they're wonderful as well, I really have great respect for them, I, I've, I've been fearful that they're awfully reliant on physical things and not reliant enough on the words and the music. And I think that w one of the things that I think is being discovered by all these shows is, is it can start with the writing only if the writing is good. It can start with a story, but it better be a good story. It better have a beginning, a, a middle, and an end, because that's something that really doesn't change. I mean, people, was emo we respond emotionally to stories. You're not answering this question, because that's true of every show. That's true whether it's no, new or revived. You've got to start with 
good writing and a good score. No, That's clearly, but, I, but my point was it, it, it was simply the new writers and new shows. I think there, we may have lost that a little bit in the sort of in an age of st starting with the director choreographer era where they were in charge, and then you know these mega things come in, and what do you, where are you supposed to go from there? In a funny way, the fact that the thing about Rent, I mean, it's all focused. It's focused primarily on Jonathan Larson. He's the writer. That's great. I mean, it's so unfortunate that he's not got, here. You've got two shows that are coming in that are, are completely unconventional as far as what we're talking about here. So there is new talent. But I think Big is the big, best example, and I keep coming back to that because there's the big adventure coming out. The it real is. chance was taken. Mm -hmm. I, I they they, they believe, in, they, they believe in, your, in your company, you believe in your material, and you're going for it. Yeah. And it's very hard to do when 10 million bucks has to be raised and gambled with. It's been the thrill of the process, though. Just it's been very collaborative. The team is very collaborative, and and every department is taking a big chance really? and going out on a limb, and that's what's been thrilling about it. So when at night when the audiences are standing, it's it's so rewarding in the back to to see what you've you've brought to that audience and just and the road that you've gone down to get there. Can you give a little breakdown of where that $10 million has gone? Really, you know, big is no bigger than what Crazy Few was five years ago. It's just where the finances were. It's just that five years ago, Crazy Few was seven and a half. And it's just, it's a smaller, everything about it is smaller than Crazy Few. Yet now, where the finances, it just equals out to be $10 million. But really, everything sets, the costumes are what we have on now. It's all contemporary clothing. So it's not the beating that the Follies girls wore in Crazy Few, but it's just that five years later, it ends up to be more money. So it really is not the um, visual extravaganza that I think uh, has been written about. But I, I, I'm always curious about that, and I've been on the inside. Where does that budget go to? I mean, sets today cost what a, a mansion costs to build on, in the Hamptons or something. Well, I know we weren't going to talk about it, but it does have to, a lot to do with unions. We weren't going to bring that up today, <laughs> but it has to do I with the not, finances not of unions. <laughs> okay. The finances of unions. Do you find that, that there's a failure of nerve among the producers, as if there's more business than show business? Do you have a tougher time getting a new show produced than applause being revived? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, yes to the first part. Uh, I don't know to the second part. Uh, uh, I've always had trouble, but everybody does. Leonard Bernstein had trouble. I used to play auditions of West Side Story, so I know how much trouble that was to get that on. Well, uh, it was not a very good show. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have a score. <laughs> Bye Bye Birdie was uh, about five and a half years, and nobody would take any uh, uh, interest in that. We would we played it for anybody. We'd keep people off the street That's and order a new show. And uh, uh, It's always been difficult. So you think it's not different today? It, it, it's 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 only different today in the fact that there are no people like Cy around who uh, uh, who will say, I don't care what I I think you guys are great and, and I'm passionate about this idea and I'll get the six or eight million dollars I'll, I'll do it. There's nobody around like that. So what you are implying in the first part of your question is absolutely true. It's very very difficult to get. You know, there's another pressure though when you're talking about eight and ten million dollars. And you're talking about the kind of shows that you and I would like to do. There's no advance. And when you think of no advance sale with a $10 million nut, it just scare the hell out of you. I mean, you probably have a problem with that, don't you? I mean, you sure. have whatever your advance has, it can't be enough to really be comforting, you know what I mean, and sure. considering the size of the budget. But you went and did it. I mean, I remember, I don't know whether you had a huge yeah, well, we did it, but <laughs> as, I, as I said, it was the, uh, the a lot. The times were very different, you know. Mm -hmm. so also, it was really a lot easier. Also, I think what's happening is that uh, you're going to regional theaters to try out something yeah, new. We have to. And not only are you going to regional theaters, but it's going on a path from a regional theater to an off-Broadway theater. And then, if there is the affirmation of success attached to it at that particular point, then maybe a producer will say, all right, well, look, we can get finance for this show. It already is a look, hit. Look, I, I did a whole other path so with Donna. Path. We did a show called Annie Warbucks together, right. which got very good notices off-Broadway. We never were able to come to Broadway, and I probably that's probably my third biggest grossing show out of town. Everybody does it, and we never went to Broadway. It's a wonderful show, yeah. It should be never, done. Never went to Broadway, but we still do. We do almost as many performances of that 
It's over half the performances that we do. Why are you saying it so reluctantly and never went to Broadway? Why wouldn't you be satisfied with it doing well and being off Broadway? Because Broadway has international attention, frankly. I mean, for for stars and for authors, uh, it... uh, it, uh, it garners attention from around the world, and I think we're all witnesses uh, to that. I, re- I remember when applause opened on Broadway, somebody sent me a newspaper from Hong Kong, an English-language uh, newspaper, the following day, which said, Lauren Bacall triumphs on Broadway. In Hong also, Kong. there's another point to, to, for that. I, I agree with that, but also, for me, <laughs> being in the show, we needed to be in a larger theater. The venue was not mm-hmm. really, right. it worked, but it wasn't right. It was and everybody felt it, even the what? audiences. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, that, that had a lot to do with the, with the la- why it didn't run, because that's a very good show. That deserved a long run. Also, Charles, I think on the road, the road is a totally different place than it is on Broadway. And I think people that are on the road had a familiarity, too, with Annie. So when it was Annie Warburg, uh, Warbucks, it was if you still a title. part. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, Annie Warburg. That might be good. <laughs> 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 Annie Warburg. You know, there was a marketing. When we did the marketing for State Fair, just to, to add to this one point, uh, the times are different. What you said about uh, people are not spending the, their money the same way today as they did many years ago, meaning that, <clears throat> that they're, right well, now while we take a break, everybody's going to stand up, stretch, and on, and sit right down again, and we'll talk about the difference of people from then the difference of the dollar, the difference Spending of how habits. much it cost for onions <laughs> at that time and now, and all the things that we've been discussing. And I think it, it, this is just wonderful to keep going back to this. But it comes back down to how much the money end of it. So stand up. Go, don't go <laughs> far away. <laughs> that was good. Right back Any more, but I like that. This is CUNY TV, Channel 75. We're continuing the American Theatre Wings discussions on working in the theatre, which are coming to you from the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. And this seminar is a very interesting one. It is called Return to Broadway. But it is more than that. It is a discussion from every part of the people that work in the theater, both the creative and the business end of it. And to head the discussion is Dash Epstein, who is a producer and a member of the board of directors of the American Theater Wing, and Martin Gottfried, who is an author, a, I don't know whether you're a producer or not, I think at some point, (laughs) not ever, but that's in the future. So please go on with this. You're discussing (laughs) what the revivals are and why. Well, I was just—I was just struck before when Donna was talking about marketing. When Showboat came in, there was. Do you remember the? That it was like a, we were inundated with, with advertising and full pages, and James Earl Jones was on the radio all the time. The work. I mean, it sounds as if half that budget was spent on advertising, and by the time they were through, it was like an Andrew Lloyd Webber show was coming in, and it was this just juggernaut of a show. You know, it was. And I thought that was really thunderous kind of producing. I don't, I don't know if that paid off. I mean, whether oh, it... Oh, sure it paid off. It was, it was treated more like an event. It sure was. And uh, it still is. And uh, it, I think a, a lot of its success right at the top had to do with its marketing. It was very cleverly marketed. And uh, that's Garth Drabinsky. He um, really chose to present it at the top like that. And because of that reason, I think Showboat's been successful. Not only because it's a great show, but because it was, uh, right at the very beginning, uh, considered an event to be a part of and to uh, view. Well, that kind of showmanship, you know, that was, I loved it. You know, it was like the old days of David Merrick. Merrick, Merrick. Yes, very Don't much so. Yeah, it's, 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 it, it, it's producing. I mean, he brought that show in. Ironically, there was a production of Showboat that played in that same theater, and the same person played one of the parts ten years earlier, and nobody remembered. That's right. <laughs> because he presented this like this is the first time this is, a, you know, this is an event. And that's great producing. You were talking about where are the Psy Fewers. There's one in Canada, there are a couple in England, and Psy, mm-hmm. Psy is here. I'm well, sorry. <laughs> keep going, more. But does that kind of, but is, does that kind of uh, you, you know, because you were involved with that with the Rogers and Hammerstein office, 
does do they spend so much money? I mean, some, I used to wonder whether they could ever get it back. Uh, that stuff is costly. There's no doubt about it. Advertising. I mean, if the one. Isabel wants to know where the ten million dollars is spent. Part of it is that. A lot. A lot of it is that. The ad rates in the New York Times for the theater, I'm told, are the highest ad rates in the entire paper. And part of the reason of that is because you don't know how long you can commit to. And when stores know they're going to get the full page all year long, because if it isn't the fall collection, it's the winter collection and the spring collection, stuff like that. But the, every single thing, you know, costs a lot of money. Advertising on the radio, television, it's all, it's all expensive. Do you think you could almost create a hit? You can try, but then it better deliver. Yes, you have to have the product to back it up. You well, can certainly get them in, but you have to deliver. Because some shows, people don't even remember. They didn't, for instance, Evita or Cats, didn't, people don't remember. They didn't get great reviews. That's. But they had the, uh, people loved them. Also, having a good logo. I mean, the, I love the, the forum one with Nathan holding that pillar falling so apart. Because you can have one piece of the pillar or eight or ten, and you, know, and you can see just this and just that. Very cleverly done. And that's th those are that's important. I you can sorry. distance yourself from mixed reviews or negative re reviews by changing the perception, ongoing in an ongoing way. You can do that if you live long enough in a show. <laughs> now, can, can, we'll I now. thought that that uh, advertising campaign on Showboat, because it was a revival, it was a stale show, and uh, and Garth unstaled it. He freshened it up. He made it seem, as you say, he's made it into an event, which I think he had to do because of the revival aspect. On the other hand, my partner, Ernie Martin, whenever we had an impact hit, but a real impact hit, you know, the show would open, get smash notices and sell out, canceled all the advertising. We didn't have a, we didn't have a print ad or a display ad of any time for an entire year on how to succeed, for instance, just the ABCs. They were being scalped for $150 a ticket and we were selling them for eight or ten dollars, what's the point of spending your money on advertising? You can't sell any more seats than you have. When the show started to run down, then you start buying your display ads. But I think there's a lot of ego with, with a lot of these producers who like three sheets and uh, a three sheet in Schubert Alley. I don't think that has ever sold a tickle, ticket to anybody. And it's only seen by the people who pass through the alley, you know. But uh, by and large, uh, hit shows sell themselves. And I think shows like Showboat, have to be created out of the advertising. Now, Sia, when you say hit shows, I remember when I was a kid, and My Fair Lady would open, and the whole town, you know, was on its ear. Right. I mean, every you know, we were lining up for standing room and right. sneaking in during its admission. There and there was something about that when a chorus lined up, you know, it was just took your breath away. Right. And you'd buy those tickets months in advance of the balcony, and you have them in your wallet, and there was something so exciting about it, that you wanted, just all you wanted to be was a part of that. How much was an orchestra seat yeah. to My Fair Lady? You could sneak in for nothing, remember Nathan, as long as he saw this just a second act. <laughs> yeah, right. We never advertised the chorus line. But that, you know, I don't care, you know, for all the revivals, and I used to argue for them myself, that's a feeling you don't get with a revival. Well, I know, aren't you answering your own question? Well, right. That's why I like to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, there, there's something empty about the question, if I may say so. I mean, everybody would rather would rather have new shows, I think. I speak for everybody, not just uh, uh, me as a composer. Everyone would like the, you know, Donna McKechnie to, to have Donna in a new show or Nathan in a new show. I mean, what a thrill for everybody, this right, kind absolutely. of collaboration. It's it's uh, electric. It's It's fire. Uh, you don't, uh, 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 revivals right. don't give that feeling. Right. That's, you know, there's not the excitement <coughs> of a new score. Uh, you can say, well, there was Gershwin and Porter in those days, and everybody was buzzing about the new Gershwin score. I mean, we don't have it today. I don't know whose fault that is. I mean, there's another kind of music in the air, too, which you leave out That's right. a great deal. Uh, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a music which is vastly uh, electrified. Uh, we're playing in theaters that still have 23... Uh, 22 musicians uh, that that have conventional orchestrations, with the exception of adding synthesizers here and there. Uh, one of the things you might you might give uh, uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber credit for uh, is he has uh, he nods towards the uh, towards the sound of contemporary mm -hmm. uh, right. rock music. I mean, Burt Bacharach the same way when he did Promises, Promises. Uh, he was he was uh, working within that thing. Today, uh, it's it's a uh, 
uh, there, there are splintered audiences. And so perhaps to get the, the, the biggest share of those splintered audiences, you go for the people who know works like State Fair or, or The King and I and hope they'll bring their children. But it's not the, it's not the same as, a, as new theater. I mean, I don't know whether anyone even thinks it is. I mean, it, it's only happening because nobody is investing in new theater, or very few people but are. But don't you think without new shows, the theater is in, in, musical theater is in uh, danger of just dying? Sure. Yes, they have to well, be. Well, there will be new shows. Of course there will. There will yeah. be. I agree. There won't be. There's never, too much real estate in New York. They won't They've be got the same as it was in the past when there were 10 or 12 right. musicals a year. But there will be new shows. How? Well, look what's happening at, with 42nd Street with Disney, and look what is happening with the yeah, uh, be children's new, theater be that new streets. Core is doing. Yeah. I think the musical will find its way onto the stage somehow. Uh, today, uh, uh, rock and roll doesn't dramatize. It just doesn't. It, never, it doesn't, doesn't work really, on the stage. No. It doesn't work on the stage. Uh, rent notwithstanding, uh, let's see how that happens, but... Uh, uh, no, it just doesn't, the way jazz didn't. I mean, we all love jazz, right. but it just but, doesn't uh, work. It doesn't work. However, something will work. I have that confidence. Uh, somebody's going to come along, another Andrew Lloyd Webber, another Charlie in Reincarnated, and uh, uh, I, find his way. Around. I don't want to reincarnate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, though. Uh, and find his way. Somebody's going to find a key to it, and then everybody's going to line up and follow. Remember, Raj and Hammerstein stood the egg on end, and we all fell into the uh, integrated musical. For 20 years, we followed those guys around, doing a version of it. Even Guys and Dolls was, was uh, as, as, as far a pendulum swing as that was from Raj and Hammerstein, was really influenced. We were so influenced by it. Well, I, I love the, the day that I saw before him. I started to laugh in the middle of that. I'll show him, because I realized that's my lord and master. It's another version of the same moment. It's that's like, right. you know, I'm going to love right. him, but you're the one that's going to have my heart. I thought, well, it's slightly different <laughs> circumstances, right. but it's kind of... But in other words, someone is going to find a key to it, and, they're, and, and, and uh, the other people are going to fall in line. And I, I, had, I don't think the musical theater is going to disappear. It just won't. But, Simon, won't when, you talk, when you talk about originality and inventiveness, I mean, I saw Rent the other day, and I was fascinated by what I saw and it may not be everybody's cup of tea but it is new and there is a new voice there and there is a uh, new that sound is a, that is inspired coming inspired by La Boheme isn't it? that's right that's true it's a revival but again it's a revival <laughs> <laughs> live with it bro it's a revival of a different name <laughs> well unfortunately he's not allowed to uh, not, not around to uh, continue on down that path but uh, I think it's going to yeah. happen it, uh, you know, when, when, when we first entered into the theater, it was in 1950. It was called The Fabulous Invalid, and everybody was complaining how the theater was dying. <laughs> it's true. And it's been there in New York. We put it in the And show. it's continually <laughs> been dying ever since, you know. Yeah, here we since. are. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, isn't it the producers who are responsible for all these? Uh, I mean, everybody seems to be agreeing that, that they're the ones who don't want to take any risks and they'd rather have a safe show that has already been a success. Well, I mean, we, we, have we, to raise money. we just discussed the economics of it, and, and uh, there's something to be afraid of there. Without, some, without an advance sale, having 10 million bucks but at what, stake. What's to be afraid of? I have to stop you right. What's to be afraid of? $10 million, we hear, showboat. That's a lot of money. So are, are you say you're so assured of of your audience that you're willing on showboat to spend the ten million dollars? No, I think it was a big gamble. All right. Well, I then why don't you take the gamble, gamble on a new show? But he was right. I mean, he had, he had, he 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 had a showman instinct that worked, it seems to me. But he's but, working on a new show now. I mean, I, I think that, that, that there's room for everything, and there's no reason one doesn't have to exclude the other. Right. I mean, Susan's point about has, how they feed each other, and that's important. And Garth is right now working on a new show. No, I'm talking you, he is doing that. But on the whole, we're not talking about that. Everybody's saying we're scared. Charlie, you've got both Anna, which is a, a re would be a revival, comes into revivals at this point. Yeah. Would you? Are you working on a new show? I'm working on two, uh, two new shows, yes. Uh, and you'll continue to do that? Oh, yeah. Uh, the, oh, absolutely. It's my, uh, my... If it's only the cost of money, if some were, you could, they were both equal, both, this is a question that someone right. in the audience asked, would you prefer the new show to the revival? Absolutely. Forget the money. I mean, uh, but there is a, a difference. My new show, which is finished, is probably going to open in Philadelphia, uh, at a not-for-profit theater, uh, uh, after which it's going to play a theater in Texas, 
after which one in Miami Beach. Uh, I long for the days, and I've only had it on three shows, and parenthetically, they were three of the, the most successful shows I had, where I was able to play a show in front of a full paying audience under a first class contract. There is nothing like it because uh, these workshops, with the exception of a chorus line, which was basically a, a choreographic workshop, but the workshops where you, where you play it for a bunch of very smart New Yorkers who all try and help you, uh, and uh, uh, you're, you're, you're guided into doing a correct show, but you're not guided into doing an exciting show necessarily because there's no guide for that. The only guide for that is to be alone, if I may say so, at the keyboard for me to imagine what it's going to be like. That's the best guide. And then the ones that help me after that are an audience. But an audience has to pay, has to want to be excited to, uh, to see such a show. That's the kind of thing that producers are very loath uh, uh, to taking a chance on. And that's the shame, because that's, that's where it lies. That's the excitement of the theater to me. I'm talking I about the Broadway you. commercial theater, not the, the opera, which is another world uh, indeed. But uh, that's, that's where we thrive. <clears throat> I think that's well, that popularity. completely disappeared. I mean... There are shows now, new shows being written that are going out of town, like they used to. Susan is working on a new show. I'm working on a new show, uh, which hopefully, which we expect to go out of you town. You've like, got a show with John uh, Cantor and Fred Ebb, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, and that's the, How much can you tell us about the new show? How far is it in? Well, it's we're going to a workshop in, the, in June. This is the it's, skin it's of our So you believe in the workshop? First draft, what? Then you believe in the workshop process? Well, it's, just so that we can take a look at it. I don't think a workshop solves all our problems, or even many of our problems, but at least we can get a sense of where the problems are. And Charles is right, the only time we really know is when you're in front of a paying audience. Mm -hmm. But uh, They're misleading, in my opinion. I mean, I would disagree they, with you. They can with be your, misleading. We've done it, workshops together, even, and you I, get... We were destroyed by it. You get, you get <laughs> the most you wonderful help in the world because everybody, particularly around the New York theater scene, but the same in London, knows everything. But that's not what writing is about. Sure. Yeah. Writing is not about uh, uh, doing it correctly. It's about doing it incorrectly. And then finding that those moments that you were a complete fool are the moments that the whole show may ultimately live with. That's right. Whereas those wonderful moments that everybody concedes works in a workshop may give you the most earnest product in the world. Uh, I'm a firm believer not in them. I'm a firm non-believer in them. <laughs> well, so I, I think that that's one of like, the reasons why the revivals the trumpet, are, right? are so solid and so well done when they finally come back as a revival is because they all went out of town at that time when they were doing and worked with different audiences and then before they finally came in they went to the Boston's and Philadelphia's and New Haven many of the shows that time. they're all talking about uh, were not great successes out of town I happened to be in Philadelphia at the time that had a succeed open I got very good notices but I came on a and I used to work for Frank Lesser I would so I, I went into a matinee and saw one of the most dismal matinees with uh, with 48 people in the audience, and even Cy didn't look his usual ebullient self. And, and, but they believed and they worked, and these were people who paid whatever it was, $20 a ticket, and sooner or later it came into New York. What was it? I don't know. We played, uh, Noel Coward was playing against us at the Forest Theater in Sail Away. And that was cleaning and it was up. sold out, yeah. you know. Yeah. And Keen was waiting to come in with an enormous advance, yeah. and we were there with... Rudy Valley. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it's, uh, uh, <laughs> so I mean that's the. I'll tell you a funny thing that happened there. One 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 day, uh, three people came to the box office and said, "What time is the? It's how to succeed in business without really trying." Said, "What time is the lecture?" <laughs> so they said, what do you mean? What do you, what do you mean? Well, I understand that Rudy Valley is lecturing on... <laughs> but, you know, you see, these, by the way, these are the funniest things that are being said, in my opinion. I mean, not that we're not all hilarious. But these are funny because the excitement and the victory of such a, uh, an event in the theater is what excites us. It does me, and I think it does every every uh, actor here too, yeah. if I may say. Well, that's what's so murderous to me. Now, Charles is 
I, is one of the most gifted composers in our modern well, musical field. You didn't have to say that, but well, it's true. You. And he and knows more about the music. I mean, shows that he's worked on with others. And and Joe Stein, you, you wouldn't believe it. He can be very, very funny. <laughs> Susan is as the most gifted choreographer today. I honestly know that. Here we have two great stars. And all of them should be in brand new shows, and it's just murderous to me. It really is. As far as I'm concerned, producers who are just scared and are just You're trying throwing to make money cows are coming up with... You're throwing away your whole question now about the... But we are working on your show. Well, I, know, I want to see them. So do I. You'll be invited. I'm, I'm dying to see them. Can I just mention something about the audiences, you, about the last ingredient, which is very important. I really understand that... We, uh, you know, this is just a little side trip. When we started seven months ago, and it was about the Iowa State Fair 1946, and the cynics, I don't know who they were, but said, they'll never get out of Des Moines mm-hmm. with that show. But the thing that we had to learn was that the audiences there liked it, yes. And it, as, as we crossed the country, the audiences told us what, what we needed to know, and it was fantastic. And as soon as we got to the east, to Washington, that was the barometer that, that we went, oh, maybe we can make it in New York. And all that old-fashioned stuff, maybe we can make it there, you know, it was Carried really out. part of the yeah. experience and the adventure, mm-hmm. and, the, and the people make the show. The audiences made it for us. It, it's also, although we're not here to talk about critics, one of the interesting things about State Fair is that it got the same reviews across the country. And that was, this is as corny as Kansas in August. I was not about to fall for it. But I did. And if you don't you'll be sorry. But, I mean, the first time that review came in, or a version of that, we thought, oh, that's Des Moines, isn't that great? Oh, that's Omaha, isn't that great? That's Chicago, oh, that's interesting. That's Boston, that's interesting. So it really, you know, it, it, we kept saying this, I'm not sure this is coming to Broadway, I'm not sure it's coming to Broadway, but it really it had that whole sort of feel of, you know, direct connection with the people. Not all the New York critics wrote that review, but the people are coming. Well, it's a dancing is showing down. This week. This week. <laughs> Thank you. What do you? When does Big open? Big opens on Sunday. Mm-hmm. How do you feel? Nervous? Nervous, but excited. Mm-hmm. Really mm-hmm. excited. Very excited. It's it's uh, having to create a new type of choreography because it's contemporary. Um, I I couldn't use what one would say like hip hop or break dancing. It had to be something that was invented about the behavior of thirteen year olds. Because of that, it's, I feel it's something that's been uh, created and, and never seen before. And because of that, I'm thrilled that I had that opportunity. So we have all fingers crossed for it. What's your next step? Do you want to go into the producing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually working on a new project with Kander Neb, also called Steel Pier, mm-hmm. which is a musical that takes place in the 30s uh, about two people who fall in love at a dance marathon. So it's dance from beginning to end. But I'm back in the 30s again, which will be nice. In Atlantic City? In Atlantic City on the Steel Pier, sure. Part of our show is in Atlantic City, too, as a matter oh. of fact. It is. <laughs> well, let's return to Broadway, then. Yes. Are we all on Broadway, or would you would you be any place else if you had your brother? Well, we're, you? we're going, our show, we're going, going out of town and then to Broadway, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- something has changed, uh, uh, and that is uh, out of town, whatever that is, out of New York, the so-called regional theaters, the not-for-profit and the uh, uh, many cities like Houston and Chicago, etc. There's a passion for the theater that was never there before, and a, uh, a grouping of actors and stage technicians, directors, etc., where there are new theater communities that I... S- sense are as active and as passionate as New York. Don't get the international attention, you know, when you talk about Broadway and the Tonys and all that, but my sense of it is that the the passion for producing theater has grown tremendously away from Broadway. Now, I don't know whether there are any figures to do that, to uh, back that up, but that's a feeling that I have. I think that regional theater has is, is become very important, and I, I think that it's recognized. And the, the more we that Broadway uses it uh, and and lets its talent come into Broadway and our talent go out, it is healthier 
for the whole even, community. Even so, you know, we think of, when we think of these musicals, we've always called them Broadway musicals. And not just because, I mean, obviously because they started on Broadway, but there is something that we all recognize that we've all grown up and we know t today there's something about sitting in a Broadway theater when that curtain goes up that there is just nothing like it. I'm sure starting in a show for you, I mean, it must be a dream from your childhood. I, there must be nothing like it. Oh, absolutely. Um, to look up at a marquee and see your name and and uh, and and the audience reaction has been terrific and well, yeah there's not there is nothing like him I they mean, really like, cheer him when, boy when he comes out he's got a good entrance too well, yeah. Yeah. It's a very good entrance. my mother could come out at the end of that, that overture and get a hand so uh, but it's uh, yeah and, and I mean I, obviously I think that's what draws us back do you, you know. do you plan on, on um, spending time in California and that other other that they had. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I will always come back to the theater. It's my, you know, it's always been where I feel the most comfortable. Um, I, you know, I love, you know, it's nice when a movie makes a hundred million dollars, <laughs> and, and then suddenly they want you to make more movies, and that's a great, you know, ride to be on. But uh, yeah, at heart, I, I think I'll, I'm a stage actor, and so I hope to be, you know like David Burns and just finish a number and walk off the and pass out. We have to get a new play for you. Just don't let Andrew Lloyd right. Webber get hold of you. I'd love to do a new show. I promise I won't do any more revival. <laughs> well, remember your next show. He's, he's our Tony presenter. Our Tony host. host. host? host? That's right. Tony host, not, not presenter. Hi, host. indeed. Hosting indeed the Tonys. I, I think that once more we have to say this has been an American Theatre Wing seminar working in the theatre and it's coming to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York and this is just one of the seminars that the American Theatre Wing has produced. Uh, we do one on the performance and one on the play skip director, choreographer and lyricist and composer and one on the production which is everything that goes into a show from option to opening and uh, this seminar has been on return to Broadway uh, talking about the revival as an important part of the Broadway scene and this year it is indeed a very exciting part of it. I'm going to turn it over to Dasha Epstein who is our co-moderator along with Martin Gottfried who will thank the panel that's been on this show and given of their time here and, and it's been simply splendid. I'm Isabel Stevenson, I'm president of the American Theatre Wing and Dasha is a board director, I, a member of the board of directors. And even though you picked on producers, I hope all of you get new shows and I think you've been wonderful in doing what you have with the revivals or recreations if you would like to call them and I thank you Martin for helping us put this panel and all of you for being here. Thank you very much.